and there are a few things, and you could probably represent the same thing. You got fed some things and you're like, I don't know. I thought that's true. Anyone, anyone like you you've got to a point, but you're also scared to ask it. Because A, you might get kicked out of the church for asking the wrong question. B, what if you discover that what you what was sold was a lie? That's a scary thought. What if what I've been being sold is actually not true? That is a scary thought. So a lot of people refuse to ask the difficult questions because they're afraid that they've been living a lie, the people they love the most have been telling them a lie, and they don't even know it. So that is a scary place to find yourself. And so what happens is you, you enter the world, and the, world's, the world doesn't care, because the world is full of skeptics, and they don't care to ask the tough questions. And so for the first time, you're answering the questions that for your whole life you've to ask, and they're being asked by people who do not care about the truth. All they want to do is expose a lie. And so you've got nothing left to stand on. And so what I want to talk about is how do we doubt well? How do we answer skeptics who don't care about truth? That's what we're talking about today. So if that's not what you're here for, apparently there's three other good breakouts going on. Um, uh, you can get up now. Um, so, if there's one thing that we can learn from the scripture, I love the life of Thomas. Um, and what you can learn, learn from the life of Thomas is it's okay to ask questions. You can uh, open uh, your scripture and, and actually, yeah, just let me read it. Let's just save a little bit of time. Um, God's a big boy. He doesn't care about my questions. So, you, you know the story, uh, all the apostles have seen Jesus. Thomas wasn't there. And uh, so now Thomas, one of, the, one of the twelve, called the twin, he was not there when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, you've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see that, um, his hands and the mark of the nails and place my fingers in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were out inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. God was not offended by Thomas's question. Can you see that? He wanted to give Thomas the same experience as the other disciples. I think that is a, a remarkably liberating thought. The fact that God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do, he can be doubted. God does not care if he is doubted. If you do not have all the answers, that is okay. See, um, it's not wrong to ask questions. Humility says someone else may have the answer. You catch that? Humility will say someone else, some of me, might have the answer to the question that I have. Um, skepticism will say, I don't have the answer, therefore uh, the truth is unknowable. Okay? And agnostic, like that's the, uh, do you know what the, 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 the root word ignoramus? Agnostic. Okay. Same, it's the same word in a different language. That's, an agnostic does not know, will not know. So let me talk to you a little bit about the history of agnosticism, the history of skepticism. And I'm sorry if this is a little bit uh, dry, but there's, there's a point. Because if you don't learn from history, you repeat it. Uh, so you've got to learn from history. So let, let me uh, share a few things with you. So the world, every society, has experienced social movement. There's nothing wrong with uh, social movement, social development. It's, the funny thing about it is that there's always a reason for the swing. Sometimes it's a straight up pendulum. You go from one extreme to the other. So what happened is we have the Dark Ages. You guys are familiar with the Dark Ages? Where the church and the state held all the power and people were relatively uneducated. And because of the lack of education, the church got crazy and it got greedy and it perpetuated a bunch of stuff that was not true. It was not substantiated in the scripture. Uh, the, the state got crazy. They started doing a bunch of things, and so people started to get educated. Um, and what we have is we have the Reformation going on in the majority of Europe. 
So you've got it happening in England and Germany and Switzerland uh, by some of the great founders of the faith that we, that we now follow. They're having this massive reformation. The same time in France, we have the Renaissance going on, where they say everyone who is religious and in charge, we kill. Okay, so that are, they are the two extremes of what happened in response to the Dark Ages. Dark ages. So lack of, uh, lack of information led to a rebellion and a reformation. Okay, that is the, the response of what we have. So what we have is we have an outbreak of education, music, art, literature, and it's called the Renaissance. It is a rebellion against ignorance. Okay, catch that. It's a rebellion against ignorance. Seems good, right? Seems good. Okay, yeah, the, the Renaissance, in a lot of ways, did a lot of good things. A lot of good things. So then what happens is you've got these power-hungry people um, responding uh, with this newfound knowledge. So knowledge starts to, as the scriptures say in Corinthians, pop up. People know things. It goes to their head. They become powerful because they know more than other people. And so no matter who holds the knowledge, one of the things you find in postmodernism and skepticism is they say knowledge is power. And anyone in power does uh, does so by holding certain knowledge. It's one of the kind of catchphrases of postmodernism. So the social move it, it went it went on like that for a long time. So 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, modernism. Modernism. You've heard of it. It's all about you can know the truth. You, like you can have the truth. Here is the truth. Everything is kind of you can add it up. You can you can empiricalize it. You, like everything can be answered by science. So what happened is, is modernism became a movement against God. Modernism rebelled against God, and suddenly they thought, we can add up and subtract the whole world using science. We don't even need God anymore. And so what happened is you've got this guy called uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Who's heard of him? He, he popularized the idea that God is dead. Who's, who's heard that before? Okay, that, you, and who knew that that was him then? Yeah, exactly. So he was just like, he said, God is dead. We've killed him. What he was really saying is we don't need God anymore. Science has figured out the answer for everything. God is not necessary. Uh, he wasn't saying literally that he was dead. What he was saying is we have no reason for the church anymore because the church is useless. Because he looked at the church, saw a bunch of religious people that used God as a crutch. <laughs> he was like, well, I don't need that. <laughs> And so, what he said though, in response to this, he created an idea called nihilism, where you eradicate all knowledge. You, you, you know where, I, I don't come from anywhere, I'm not going anywhere, everything amounts to nothing. So on the back of nihilism, he said that we will see the bloodiest century that this world has ever seen. And that's what happened. The 20th century, he died in 1900. Frederick Nietzsche died in 1900. The 20th century, more people were killed uh, than the other 19 combined. And most of those deaths, think about it, you've got World War I, or World War II, you've got the Vietnam War, you've got the, uh, the genocide in Rwanda, you've got uh, Idi Amin in uh, Uganda, you've got Pol Pot in, uh, in wherever Pol Pot was, Cambodia. Uh, you, you've got all these regimes and what you find at the center of every one of those regimes, atheism. The middle of every single one of them. So exactly as uh, Nietzsche, he was kind of a social prophet, exactly as he prophesied is what happened. And, and so uh, it, it, is, it is a devastating fact that this, this atheistic movement away from God called modernism became uh, the bane of the 20th century. And so what happens is, is the skeptics started moving it. People started rebelling against uh, this utopian ideology. That's how, how philosophers would describe it. The kind of, oh, we can do what we want to justify that. So the means will justify the ends. So Stalin looked at the fact that we will create a perfect communist government. Hey, it was all right killing uh, 20 million of his own people. He was totally fine with that. Um, Hitler, same thing. But look, if we, if we have our, our, our third Reich, thousand year reign, it's all right if we wipe out entire nations on our way there. It's okay because we'll have a better nation. Utopian ideals. 
And so this is what we're talking about. So the skeptics started looking at that saying, okay, what we see is whenever there's one massive ideal that everyone follows, it goes bad. Makes sense, right? So they started rebelling against single ideals. And this is really interesting. Listen to this. This is G.K. Chesterton, book I highly recommend. It's called Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. He says this, The new rebel is a skeptic. He will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, but he can never really be a revolutionist. The fact that he doubts everything really gets in the way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciations implies a moral doctrine of some kind. The modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. Listen to this, this is, this is really, really quite insightful. As a politician, he'll cry out that war is a waste of life. But then as a philosopher, that all life is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant, then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. This man goes to school, uh, the, this, the man of this school first goes to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts, but then he takes his hat and umbrella, goes to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In short, the modern revolutionist being an infinite skeptic is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling, trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he's lost his right to rebel against anything. Does that make sense? Did everyone follow that? G.K. Chesterton, really, really witty author. Uh, my favourite author is Ravi Zacharias. He quotes, quotes Chesterton a lot. Okay, so if you want to kind of get a primary source, I highly recommend Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. So, put it this way, our world, the world you and I live in, has stopped trusting. That's the world we live in. We have stopped trusting. We are intrinsically cynical and rebellious. All forms of authority are now doubted. So parents are thrown into doubt. Uh, their authority is thrown into doubt. The family is falling apart. Who recognizes the family is falling apart? Um, the national leaders are thrown into question. Who knows our nation is falling apart? Okay, uh, ethics are thrown into question business world is tearing itself apart. They don't even need any help. They're tearing themselves apart because there's no ethics in business. But, um, like so uh, schools, the education system is down. In doubt. Schools are falling apart. Who knows that this is true? I'm just telling you the power of skepticism. I'm getting to a point here. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy... Arguments. Say arguments for me. Arguments. We destroy lofty opinions. Say lofty opinion. Lofty opinion. Raised against the knowledge. Say knowledge, knowledge. Of God. And they take every thought. Tell me thought. Every thought captive to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is complete. Let me throw out you. This is where our warfare happens. As Christians. The Apostle Paul. We destroy lofty arguments. Where do arguments start? Every lofty opinion, where do lofty opinions exist? <clears throat> In your mind. Against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive. The entirety of our fight is here. And so it's not strange that the things that sway our world are ideologies. It's not a strange thing. It actually makes sense that ideologies sway our world. It's even the warfare that you and I are engaged in. And so we must take into account when we're doing all of this stuff, as we fight this ideological war, it's not against people. Against ideas, it's against institutions, it's, it's against things that launch themselves against the knowledge of God. That is the fight that we're fighting. Wherever something stands in opposition to the knowledge of God, that is the battle line that we are facing. Um, listen to this, and this is, this is fantastic. Because as soon as we enter this battle, what we find is you get sidetracked. Who has been sidetracked by apologetics before? I have been sidetracked by apologetics. I have offended many people using apologetics, okay? And I, I apologize in front of all you people on behalf of them. But listen, this is what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 16. 
Remind them of these things and charge them before God. Don't quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, but avoid irrelevant, fa irrelevant babble, for it will lead people into more ungodliness. Okay? Yeah? Self-explanatory, anyone? No? Okay, we've got time. We've got time straight. We're going to just move on. That is just a good word. Thank you, Paul. Um, so this is totally common in the church. How many of you have sat in church and been like, oh my goodness? Maybe you have, anyone go to college here who here is in college? Maybe you're part of a Christian group in college. Some of the group the discussion that goes on, kind of hang your head in shame. It's just like, why don't we have this conversation? Like, this is going nowhere. In fact, I think it's going to lead to more ungodliness. Okay, that's what Paul's talking about. Okay, he was talking about college and Christian groups. That's what he was talking about. Um, and so... Um, what, what is the faith of a postmodern? And I'm going to recommend a book to you. Oh, my bag's in the other room. Can you, can you go get a plane? Um, next door. I think Eric can do a session in there. So, um, sorry. Okay. Um, at least we're like, less distracting than the music thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that leads me to the, my next point is that skeptics like to take the moral high ground. Um, Okay, so uh, what is the faith of a postmodern? What is, how do I define a skeptic? A skeptic doesn't want to be defined. By definition, they are undefinable. And they do not want to be defined because they're rebelling against everything. Okay, if there is an established order, they're rebelling against it. And so if there is an umbrella that they can be defined under, they're going to rebel against it. And, and so in defining a skeptic, you're better off asking questions of them than telling them who they are. Did, did you catch that? And this is true of most worldviews. If you meet a Muslim, then there's Sunnis, Shiites, and, 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 a, and a thousand other denominations of Muslims, just like there are Christians. So if a Muslim tries to tell you about uh, how white denominations are, are like ungodly, uh, okay, it's not working for you. Okay? Hindus, same thing. They have three different Bibles. Okay, from three different eras. Okay, there's like the three and a half thousand year old Bible, the one and a half thousand year old Bible, and the five hundred year old Bible. And all three of them sit together in one little volume. Do you know why the second one was written? Because they disagreed with the first one. <laughs> and you could probably guess why the third one was written. <laughs> Do you know where the first come from? They're rebelling against Hinduism. Buddha was born a Hindu. He became the first Buddhist. You get where I'm going here? Like, like, and, and then within, then you've got three major movements of Buddhism. And, and so they can't talk to you about denominationalism and, and, and schisms either. Do you know who Sikhs are? They disagree with Hindus and Muslims, so they combine Hinduism and Muslim and, and Islam. I mean, we live in a crazy world, okay? We're not the only one with problems, and we can pat ourselves on the back for that. We are okay. We're doing okay. Um, and, and do, do you know why there's moderns and postmoderns? Because even atheists disagree with each other. My point is, you're better off asking questions than telling people what they believe. Okay, you um, don't chop someone's nose off and then offer them a rose. Okay, uh, it's, it's a bad idea. Okay, there we go. So they have the moral high ground. This is a definition of postmodernism. They don't want to be defined, but a couple of places do it anyway. I think this was Wiki Answers. I don't know, I wouldn't work at college, but we're not at college. We're in church, so I can reference things that aren't references. <laughs> okay. um, Postmodern philosophy is a philosophical direction which is critical of the foundational assumptions and universalizing tendencies of Western philosophy. It emphasizes the importance of power relationships, personalization, and discourse in the construction of truth and worldviews. Okay, the way that they make their world fit together is power relationships. Okay, what relationships hold the power? Okay, what ideas hold the power? Um, Personalization, how I feel, and discussion. How do you feel? <laughs> Let's create a world. Okay, that's the most common. Okay. Obviously, that's very hard to find. Okay, uh, this is Britannica.com, for those who actually wanted a legitimate uh, source. A uh, late 20th century movement characterized by sport broad skepticism, subjectivism, or relativism, a general suspicion of reason and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. Can you see how that fits with what I've been talking about so far? Can you see how this is kind of meshing together? This is the people that you engage in with from day to day, okay? 
Like this is who I am talking to the majority of the time. We live in a postmodern world. Okay? That, that's why we're talking about this. So the skeptic never really trusts anything. This is one of the definitions uh, specific to our, our postmodern culture. No one is no one is kind of holding to anything, they're just doubting everything. Okay, everything is held in arms like not like anything in my heart. Uh, because it might be a uh, fascist or a, or a communist or a, or a Nazi and they're going to tell me and they're going to kind of pillage my heart so I will never trust anything, okay? And sometimes this stuff even happens in the church, right? You ever seen someone on a power trip in the church? If you haven't, just kind of buckle up because <laughs> they're there. Um, and, and so this is something great from C.S. Lewis. For anyone who likes C.S. Lewis, this is in uh, The Abolition of Man. Uh, you can't go on seeing through things forever. Because the whole point of seeing through something is to see something through it. To see through all things is the same as to not see. Okay? You catch that? Okay? Postmodern seek through everything. Oh, they're alive. They're alive. Oh, oh, oh. No, they're doing this because they believe in that. They're doing this because oh, they see through everything. Problem is, they don't end up seeing anything. If they feel like they've found like the universal solvent, the thing that no matter what you put it in, it dissolves properties, you can't find a container to hold a universal solvent. And that, that, that is the problem that, that these guys are running into. Have you heard of the saying, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones? Yeah? And so this, this is the point. That saying is for the postmodern. The whole point of that saying is if you live in a house that's so fragile um, that it doesn't sustain anything, don't throw stones at other people's houses. Okay, so if, if you're living in a glass house, a glass house is very fragile. The moment you start throwing stones at other people, your glass house will come down. If you are pulling down every other ideology, but you have no ideology, yours will fall apart. So if all you do is criticize, your worldview is not sustainable. Now take that to your heart if you're a Christian. If all you do is criticize, your house will crumble. If you're in a glass house, don't throw stones. Don't accuse any other worldview if you don't have one. If you say you don't have one, you're kidding yourself. You do have one, it's just if you throw stones, it's gonna come from you. That's what's gonna happen. And, and, and so, uh, let, let's go into this. We have like five more minutes. Um, and before, and I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, how do we answer the postmodern. And so, we're not the first to come, stumble across this skeptical postmodern uh, rebellious ideology. When Jesus was preparing to be crucified, you'll find this uh, in the Gospel of John. Then Pilate said to him, Are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose, for this purpose I was born, for this purpose I have come into the world to be a witness to the truth. Everyone who listens to of, uh, who everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he said this, he went outside and uh, to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Have you ever talked to someone that just wants to tear down all of your arguments um, and then they walk away like they just won? <laughs> but they didn't even wait for you to answer. And yeah, you've had those. Okay, so uh, this is what Solomon says in the book of Proverbs. He says, the first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination cross starts. Okay, uh, that's, that's real true. Okay, uh, Jesus is the alpha and omega. The, the whole point of even entering the, skeptic, the, the world of the skeptic is because I have the answer. Look, I, I've been around the bush a couple of times now. Uh, I've run around the tree. Uh, I've been on the merry around a little while. Just, just, a, just a little bit of time. I've experienced a bit of this world. And this is the one thing that I do know. That Jesus is the answer. Like, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, from, from my own life. I remember I was, I was probably 22 years old and I used to run a, a young adult group in my, in my church back home in Australia and I, I ran it for the young adult boys. And they would come, uh, we'd come, go to someone's house and we'd, uh, we'd share food and, uh, and, and the word of God and it was a great time. One of my young adults came to me and he was just like, man, my, my brother-in-law uh, is getting real caught up in, in all this like atheism stuff and, and, and it's it's starting to sink my faith because he talks about it so much. And I'm like, okay, what are you talking about? What are the authors? What are like, uh, have you got any material? You show it to me and we'll, let's talk about it. And he was just like, yeah, I can get one. And he gave me a, a, a it's, it's like a journal article. 
by a guy called Sam Harris. Who's heard of Sam Harris? He's like a militant atheist. Okay, his, his job is to convince people that Christianity is not true. Now, if there is no God, I don't know the point, but apparently he's into it. And so he writes a lot of stuff and debates a lot of people. And his whole purpose is to dethrone Christianity. That's his purpose in life, to convince people to not be Christian. And so he had this... Um, this, uh, this article called um, uh, "The End of the End of Faith," and, and, and so I read it. And I'm laughing at this. I'm not even going to lie. I'm laughing at this. It's not even describing Christianity. It's like a caricature of Christianity, and he, he's painting the caricature. And he's like, "Look how stupid Christianity looks." And all the Christians are looking at it, going, "That's uh, not what I look like." I, 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 I don't know if you've heard the straw man argument. It's, it's what it is. You paint a picture of what someone looks at. And it looks like when that person looks at it, it's like, it's not me. I don't, know, I don't know what you're doing. And so this is what was going on. I got to one thing in this article. I was like, I don't have an answer for that. That's actually a fair point. That's actually a good point. And I have no answer. And slowly that became to me a, a, like a rot in my soul. It was like gangrene in my soul, if that makes sense. And it really started to tear me apart. That I didn't have an answer to this question. Now, uh, luckily, Ravi Zacharias has actually written a book called The End of Reason in response to the end of faith. Brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, and response, boom, boom, line upon line, just tears the thing apart. He gets pretty angry, actually, in the book. It's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and so I, I did read that two years later. So here I am, falling apart in my faith. Uh, my faith is really not doing well. And I, I get to the point, my brother, he's gone through a mental breakdown, literally, at this time. I go to my brother, and, and me and him, we start talking, and he's like, how you doing? I'm like, man, I'm doing bad. And I'm like, are you doing nothing bad? Like, That's not good. And so we're talking, and I, I bring up this journal article, and I'm like, yeah, I read this thing from Tobin and church, and, and uh, I'm just trying to help him, but man, it's sinking me. I don't even understand it. It's like one thing, it's not even a big deal. It's not even the core of what I believe, but it's sinking. Um, and so as we're talking about this, he's like, have you still got the article? I'm like, yeah. It's like, burn. Yeah, it's like, yeah, back yeah, it's like, 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 it's like, yeah, 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 it's I can't explain it, but something lifted off my shoulders the moment I did that. And I did not have an answer to my question. But in that moment, I was saying, Jesus, I want to trust you. And I fixed something in my heart that had become separate that said, Jesus, I don't trust you. Did you catch that? It's all to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. See, everything else... Like everything else, like people want to throw at you, they're all dodging the question of Jesus Christ because history can't even answer, uh, argue with Jesus Christ. And then, I mean, you, once you once you start entering the actual evidence behind our faith, you like, I'm sorry, my gloves are on. We can do this thing. Like, there is so much evidence for Christ. And there is so much evidence for the truth of the Scripture. But what it will come down to is how's your relationship with Him. That's what it's really going to come down to. Well, exactly what we shared in today. How's your faith in the power of the gospel? That's really where it's going to start the faith. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And all of these questions, social movements, ideologies, they're going to come, they're going to go. How's your relationship with Christ? Because 2,000 years of ideologies have come and gone, and Christ is still the same. With Christianity... You can read something from the early church fathers and you can get hopping up and down because that'll preach still. You hear what I'm saying? Like, because it's just true. It's just true. And so here is my answer to all of the questions. Get your relationship with Jesus right. If you're a skeptic, get your relationship with Jesus right. I'm a skeptic and that was what fell apart. And so that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you guys. I hope that, I know I shared like a bunch of stuff. And uh, here's a couple of books I'm going to recommend, Beyond Opinion. It's co-authored by a bunch of people. 
it's hitting a bunch of questions, bunch of worldviews, uh, and he kind of, Ravi Zacharias puts the whole thing together. Uh, and so he authors a couple of the chapters, but there's a bunch of people on his team, <coughs> his preaching and evangelistic team that he puts that together well with. Totally recommend it, the other read before. Here's another one, uh, choosing your faith. The point of this book is everybody in the world has a faith, some people just don't recognize it. At the end of the day, you put your faith in something. Um, for the skeptic, you're putting your faith in that there is no truth. It's kind of dangerous. How's that going to go for you in the court of law? Um, uh, yeah. It's a whole other topic. Um, so it's called Choosing Your Faith, Mark Mittelberg. M I T T E L B E R G. But if you obviously Google Choosing Your Faith, that's what's going to come up. Um, so those are my uh, recommendations for books. Uh, and obviously, I could recommend a whole lot more. But uh, it's kind of, this one's really easy. This one's full of big words. <laughs> okay, and so that's <coughs> what I want to do. We've got like. Uh, eight minutes left, and so if anyone's got any questions, I know that I didn't really hit any specifics at all. Yeah, what's your name, sorry? My name is Alec. Alec? Yeah, Alec. Uh, well, you kind of hit, you kind of answered quite a lot of my question at the end for your relationship with Jesus, uh, because my, as one as a believer, apologetics is always confusing. Sure. Uh, So the question is, is it okay to live with apologetics or without it? Like, is it, is it okay? Honestly, horses for courses, uh, everyone is not going to be in the same race. Uh, and that is okay. Uh, if you're drawn, if you've got genuine questions, you need answers. And the road that Jesus takes you on is the people that he's going to put on your road. So if you're not a thinker, chill. It's all right. Uh, you're going to encounter people that are not thinkers. And if I try and think my way through a conversation with someone that is highly emotional, all I'm going to do is offend them. That's all I'm going to do. And so one of the things uh, I think is a great thing, I've learned this in, uh, in marriage, before you fix it, feel it. Uh, before you try and fix a situation, Feel it out, get the emotion, get the empathy going, see where that person's coming from, understand the road they're on, then you might validate actually pouring something into their life. Till that point, mm -mm, sit on it. <laughs> not your place. And so uh, that's a very good question because yes, there is a time where you will not be ready and you'll just chop people's nose off to try and offer them a rose. At that point, the rose is not very desirable. Um, so, uh, did, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Al. Great question. Anyone else? Yeah. Name? I'm going to read his uh, question. Sure. It says, uh, how do you answer to the ideology that men created God as a way to survive and create a false sense of security and pleasure? And that's, the, that's why there are so many religions that also experience supernatural situations. That's okay, so how do we respond to people that say that God <coughs> is a creation that we have made up? Uh, and like as religious people, and that explains, and, um, and, and so have to, let me just kind of split it, and I'll come back to the second half of the question. How do we respond to people that say that God is just made up? Like, how, how do we respond to that? And I, I like, so, uh, I forget who it was that said God is the opiate of the people. Um, but, uh, who was it that they, they said within, within a generation, the Bible will be uh, relegated to the the histories and the museums, because within our lifetime we'll see it destroyed. Well, the guy that said that, his Voltaire, his house is now the home of the Bible Society in France. <laughs> um, and the Bible 
uh, continually stands up to outlive its pallbearers. The people that say they're ushering out the word of God. It's survived every single time. There is no book that is more scrutinized on the earth. There isn't. You don't find Muslims standing up saying, hey, check out the Quran. You can do what you want with it. No, the people who do that get killed. But in Christianity, it's open season on the Bible. Idiots get to look at the Bible and make their opinion. But the Bible still stands. Um, and God still moves. And I think that's powerful. And, and I, as much as, yes, we do see miracles all over the world. Absolutely. Uh, I was talking with one of my uh, assistants at church the other day uh, about skepticism and stuff like that and prep for this. And one of the things that, um, that she said is uh, someone who wanted control and power, which is where your postmodernists are coming from with religion. Religion is a way of controlling the people. Um, and the opiate for the masses kind of subdue them all. That's the point of that, that whole point. Uh, you would not come up with Christianity. That is not where you would arrive. If Jesus wanted to kind of pull the wool over everyone's eyes and just like, uh, if the disciples just made it up, they would have said, and Ravi Zacharias says this, and I think it's a great point, they would have said, oh, Jesus is going to resurrect spiritually. You can't fake that. You can fake that. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, oh, yeah, he already did it. He already did it. But the body was gone. I mean, there is so much evidence. Where did the church come from? How did it spread throughout the whole world within a generation? Why do we have the whole Bible re replicable from people who are quoting the scripture within a generation? I can replicate the, I can rewrite the whole canon of the scripture within a generation of the apostles who wrote the scripture. So with their sermons that they wrote with the letters, so you know how Paul would write a lot, a lot of letters? Okay, Paul's disciples, John's disciples, Peter's disciples, they all had disciples. Uh, they wrote letters to each other as well. Those letters, you can rewrite the whole New Testament within one generation. You've got, I've got excerpts of the Gospel of John from 150 AD. I've got prophecies uh, of the, from the Old Testament uh, replica, like proven in the New Testament, but those prophecies are from 350 BC. It, it's so, all of, the, all of these things kind of come together. There's a massive amount of evidence that say, okay, yeah, I hear where you're coming from, that some people are subdued by religion. Absolutely. Fair. Some religious leaders have abused religion uh, to get control. Yes, that doesn't mean it's entirely true. And so there is a point, but it's not the full story. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. What was the second part of the question? Second half was... <laughs> is that why there are so many religions that also experience supernatural situations? Um, I think the reason that so many spirits, uh, so many people experience supernatural things is because we live in a world uh, that is spiritual. Even Paul says uh, the things that are unseen are more real than the things that are seen. And so if, if Paul is right in saying, put on the full armor of God so that you'll stand with the armor of God, I can't see any of that. So there is a battle going on that I do not see. So I can go to a, a nation and, and see things that are out of control. Like you will see demon possessed people. I'm sorry, in a, in a materialistic framework, somebody explain that to me. So the reason that you see what you do is, is because we live in a spiritual world. Uh, unashamedly, there is, there is stuff that is beyond explanation to the materialistic person. And materialism is the belief that there is nothing outside of the material world. The material world is all there is, it's all we have, um, kind of nihilism uh, of nature. Um, and so, yeah, I, I know that was a very short answer, but I, I mean, that's the reason you see it. Why are there so many religions? Um, because everyone tries to figure out their way to God. But Christianity is God coming to man to reconcile man to himself. It's totally different. Um, so, yeah. Well, if you guys want to chat, um, I will be available uh, later today. But it's time for our next session now. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, was, we also have Q&A tonight. Oh, you got Q&A tonight. Yeah, we got after 30. Yeah, yeah after 30 tonight, Q&A. I got to go to Can you take your time with his ear and turn on the deal with us? Hey, give him Rami. Rami, podcast. Uh, he loves Rami. He loves Rami. Yes. He still has a, after all this, Rami is good.